This video is going to explain a discrimination lawsuit from beginning to end. I've made videos in the past about how to figure out if you have a discrimination case, and I've made videos about how much those cases might be worth. This video, on the other hand, is going to describe the process of the lawsuit. What do you, the client, go through step by step? Before we get into the stuff on the whiteboard, I have two very quick and easy things to cover. First, this video discusses the typical discrimination lawsuit, if there actually is such a thing. Every case is drastically different, but this video discusses the typical stages that we see most often in the discrimination cases that we handle. Second, while I only represent clients in California, these lawsuit stages are very similar from state to state. So no matter where you live, this video will be highly informative. One more thing, I almost forgot. If you feel like you have a case for discrimination and you were fired and you wanna know what a lawyer like me thinks about your situation, feel free to reach out to my office for a free consultation if you feel I've earned your phone call. My office provides consultations for California residents Monday through Friday, and they're always free. Also, I highly recommend before you call anybody that you watch my other videos on discrimination. I'll link to those at the end of this video. All right, let's get to it. Obviously, this entire journey starts with a discriminatory act or actions by the company. So when your boss, coworker, or other supervisor takes an adverse action against you, because you have a protected characteristic. Now, I won't get deep into this in this video, but in order for the discrimination against you to be unlawful, the company must take action against you because you have a legally protected characteristic. These protected classes or categories are established by California law. For example, race, age, disability, gender, sexual orientation, etc. If you want to know more about the legal definition of discrimination and see all of the protected characteristics that apply in California, watch my discrimination law video. I'll leave a link at the end of this video. Now this discriminatory act, this discriminatory act could be a refusal to hire, a demotion, failure to promote, harassment, or most commonly, a termination. Now we first need to talk about employees generally who got fired. If you didn't get fired or you quit your job, we'll talk about those scenarios in just a minute. But first, in most discrimination cases that lawyers like me handle, our client was fired from the job. And if you're watching this video, you probably just got fired from your job or you think you might get fired. How you handle your termination is very important because your actions at that moment can help you win your discrimination case or they can destroy it. Obviously, if you are fired, you can expect to be pretty upset and emotional about it, especially if you feel like it was based on a protected characteristic. But it's important that you stay calm. Anything that you do will come out later in court. So stay calm. Don't do the following things. Don't scream at your boss or use any profanity. Don't threaten to sue the company. Most importantly, don't sign a severance agreement until after you talk to a lawyer. Severance agreements, what are those? A severance agreement, also known as like a separation agreement or settlement agreement, is a written contract between the company and the fired employee. The contract says that the company will give you money in exchange for you giving up your right to take legal action against them. I can't tell you how many times people have called my office and had, and had a very good discrimination case, but because they took the quick $800 or $7,000 or $20,000 in severance, they lost their ability to sue for hundreds of thousands of dollars. So please don't be one of these people. Call a lawyer before you sign a severance agreement, please. My office does severance reviews all the time and we do it for a very reasonable fee. I made an entire video on the value of severance packages and what's fair or not, so I'll leave a link to that as well at the end of this video. Okay, well what if you're a victim of discrimination and you're still employed? Can you sue for discrimination? Well, the short answer is yes you can, but 
it's unlikely that it will make financial sense for you, the client, to sue if you're still employed. I don't have time to get deep into this subject here and in this video, so I'll try to cover this in a later video. Okay, well what if you quit your job? Can you pursue a case for discrimination? Again, yes you can, but it's also unlikely that it'll make financial sense for you, with some exceptions, right? If you sue after you quit your job, after experiencing discrimination, uh, there's a couple hurdles. The major exception to this is in extreme cases. In horrible discrimination cases, people sometimes win a constructive termination claim and the court will treat them as if they were fired. This is super important when it comes to the value of your case and calculating damages in front of a jury. So I'll try to get more into that in a later video. The next step is to hire a good employment lawyer. This is the most important step for you to do right. You absolutely want to find an attorney that you trust and who has the time in his or her schedule to work your case up the right way. The lawyer you're on the phone with might be the best attorney on the planet, but if he or she doesn't have enough time to dedicate to your case, you will not get a satisfactory settlement. You will learn pretty quickly that lawyers like me are obsessed with time, and there is a good reason for that. Each discrimination case that we handle is a tremendous amount of work, but your legal team, i.e. the lawyer, is going to do 98% of that work. Well, so what should you expect when contacting and hiring a lawyer? Well, the first person you speak with will probably not be the lawyer. This is totally fine and normal. You will probably speak with an intake specialist or paralegal who will ask you a bunch of questions about what happened to you and will write everything down. This person should give you enough time to tell the basics of your story, but this isn't the right time to get into every nitty gritty detail. We don't need that at this point. Just tell your basic story, answer the questions that the intake person asks. After this, usually the lawyer will review your case within a day or two. If it looks like you might have a case, the lawyer or intake person will call you to get more information and set up an in-person meeting. Now, if you decide to hire that lawyer, likely you will hire him or her on a contingency fee. This means the lawyer only gets paid if they successfully recover money on your behalf. They get a percentage of the recovery at the end of the case, and you don't have to pay any money out of pocket up front. On the other hand, if the lawyer believes that you don't have a case or can't prove your case, which are two different things, the intake person will call you or send you an email saying that the law firm cannot represent you at this time. Now, just because one lawyer turns down your case doesn't mean you don't have one. I've taken cases that other lawyers have turned down and settled them for a lot of money. And since I'm an honest guy and we're being honest here, I've also turned down cases before that other lawyers went on and settled for a lot of money. So the moral of the story is you might have to call several law firms before you find a lawyer to take your case. However, if you've called six or seven lawyers and they've all turned down your discrimination case, that might be an indication that you don't have a very good case or it's impossible to prove, and legal action might be a bad idea. Now we all know and we've all heard that lawsuits last a long time. Why is that? The reason discrimination cases take so long is that the rules of civil, pro civil procedure set up deadlines for everything. They file, you, you file the case, they have 30 days to respond. You serve a discovery interrogatory on them, they have a certain amount of time to respond. Your lawyer only has a small amount of control over how fast or how slow your case moves. You ask for a trial late date, the judge sets it a year and a half out. So don't be surprised if your lawyer says, you're probably not gonna hear from me for a month or two. This will happen several times throughout your case and it's all very normal. After you hire a lawyer, the very first thing that your attorney is going to do is work on learning all the facts. Extensive fact finding is what I call it. The facts of your case are incredibly important. Your lawyer needs to know all of them. How I personally handle this process is that we verbally go over your story multiple times and I take extensive notes. Then I ask most of my clients to write me a timeline of events. The client sits down and writes me a letter essentially that describes exactly what happened and when it happened. This includes the good facts of the case and the bad facts of the case and everything in between. In addition to the story, I also gather all relevant documents. 
This includes things like emails, text messages, the company handbook, the company policies and procedures, social media posts, company articles, video and audio recordings, and anything else that might possibly be relevant to the case, good or bad. The early part of this case also reveals what kind of client I'm gonna have. Do I have a client that's responsive, will follow my directions, or do I have a client that ignores my emails and slow to respond to me or doesn't pay attention to detail? If my client is one that tends to exaggerate, I'm gonna now know it. It's at this point of the case where I know if I have a good client or a bad one. And trust me, if you're working with me, you wanna be a good client. The fifth stage is the pre-litigation demand. Okay, you've hired a lawyer and that lawyer has gathered most of the facts and documents. Now what? Well, in some cases, not all of them, lawyers like me send a demand letter to the company. At this point, the case has not been filed in court yet, but I'm telling the company in a letter that they're gonna get sued, what they're gonna get sued for, and if they want to prevent that lawsuit from happening, we need to attempt to settle the case. And as I get wiser in my career, I find myself sending less and less of these pre-litigation demand letters because in discrimination cases, it only results in a satisfactory settlement in about 10 to 20% of cases. Moreover, I would rather just file the lawsuit to show them that I'm serious, do some discovery, meaning get documents and, and testimony from them, and put some financial pressure on the company that tends to get my clients a much better result. Before we get to the other steps of this lawsuit, if you're finding this video to be helpful, can you please give it a thumbs up on YouTube? That tells YouTube that these kind of videos that I'm making are useful to people and they help people figure out this complex world of employment law. All right, let's get to number six. Now, assuming your lawyer doesn't send a demand letter or the case fails to settle early on, your lawyer will next file the case in court. And the lawyer does that by drafting the complaint, which is the legal document that initiates your case in court. You might review this document, but you certainly won't have anything to do with drafting it. After the complaint is filed with the court, your lawyer will hire somebody to serve that lawsuit on the company, meaning actually physically deliver the lawsuit to the company. Once the case is filed, you, the employee, become the plaintiff and the company becomes the defendant. Generally, the company has about 30 days to respond to your lawsuit. However, this deadline is frequently extended, so don't be surprised if it takes 60 days. After the case is filed, usually the company's lawyers will file a document called a motion to strike or a demur or something to that effect. These are formal requests asking the judge to do something. We lawyers call these motions, so these are early motions in the case. Usually these motions are an early effort to throw out your entire case or a part of your case. You will have virtually nothing to do with this step in the case. It's simply the lawyers bickering over the law. There's usually a court hearing, but you will not attend. Assuming you have a good lawyer and a good case, these motions are usually denied. If they are granted, sometimes your attorney can amend the case to keep it alive. But don't sweat this part of the case, it has very little to do with you. Early in any discrimination case, the lawyers on both sides are going to begin discovery. Discovery, written discovery, is a fancy lawyer term or phrase that just means these sides are exchanging information. Basically, the rules of civil procedure have set up mechanisms for the sides suing each other to exchange essential information. This is necessary for our judicial process to work and to assist parties in facilitating settlement. There are a few different types of written discovery. Number one, there's requests for production of documents. This is where your lawyer sends a written demand to the other side demanding certain documents. Next are interrogatories. This is where your lawyer sends a written question list to the other side that those questions need to be answered under oath. Next are requests for admission. This is where your lawyer sends written requests that the other side need to either admit or deny certain facts. While this might seem pretty straightforward, I need you to take note, discovery goes both ways. The company is gonna send you all these written requests as well, and you're gonna to have to help your lawyer in answering them. And this can be an uncomfortable process as they might or probably ask questions or request certain documents that you certainly don't want them to know. Well, what kinds of things would they want? 
anything, they will want anything that is relevant to the lawsuit. Emails, text messages, handwritten documents, video recordings, audio recordings, doctor's notes, medical records, social media posts, and more. In certain situations, your lawyer can block certain requests or keep certain facts or documents out of trial, but that depends on the law and the type of case. It doesn't depend on your lawyer, it depends on the law. Next are depositions. Most people have heard about depositions. A deposition is a type of oral testimony under oath where the opposing lawyer gets to ask witnesses questions in real time. This is done in person, usually in an attorney's conference room. Now, a deposition is usually a one day or a half day event. The witness sits down in the conference room with a lawyer, the opposing attorney, and a court reporter. The court reporter writes everything down that the witnesses and the attorneys say. Your lawyer will likely depose several witnesses throughout the case. This includes the person who discriminated against you, people who can talk about your job performance or lack thereof, human resources, and anyone else who has information that is relevant to your case. But just like written discovery, the opposing lawyer gets to depose you as well. You meet with your lawyer and go to the opposing lawyer's office where the attorney asks you questions for usually several hours. Aside from trial, depositions are the scariest part of your case, but they don't need to be, and you'll see why in just a second. The opposing attorney is gonna ask you a bunch of questions during your deposition, and all you have to do is answer them. If the lawyer asks you an inappropriate question, your lawyer will defend you and might even tell you not to answer the question, depends on the situation. But the easy thing about all of this is all you have to do is tell the truth. And all you have to do is answer the questions honestly. So if you've been honest with your attorney up to this point, this should be pretty easy. Next on our list is summary judgment. In some discrimination cases, not all of them, the defense lawyers file a big old motion called summary judgment. You won't have much to do with this motion except for read some documents, answer your lawyer's questions, and sign some paperwork. But the reason why I bring it up, it is a tremendous amount of work for your lawyer to properly oppose summary judgment. So if you know your lawyer is working on an opposition to summary judgment, make sure you return his or her phone calls and emails ASAP. Next, we have mediation and or settlement. Settlement of your case can take place at any time throughout the life of the case, but usually settlement occurs after depositions have been done. And in today's litigation environment, most discrimination cases settle at a process called mediation. Mediation is usually a one day event. A mediator is hired for the day and you and your lawyer go to a legal office and sit in a fancy conference room. The company and their lawyers go to the same office but sit in a different conference room. The mediator, who is usually a retired judge, goes back and forth between the two rooms throughout the day, and he or she discusses the strengths of the case, the weaknesses of the case. He, ar he or she argues with the attorneys, and, uh, and he or she is the person who takes the monetary offers back and forth between the sides. The mediators get paid good money to help settlement discussions. Mediation is a confidential process, so even some things that you might talk with mediator about will never come out and in court. Moreover, some mediators actually make what's called a mediator's proposal at the end of the mediation, which is a dollar number that they think the two parties might accept. If both parties accept that number, the case settles. If one party or both parties don't, obviously the case continues. Well, how much will your case settle for? I've made an entire video all about the monetary value of discrimination cases. So if you want to know how lawyers like me value cases or what your case might settle for, go watch that video because it'll answer most of your questions. You can also view it on my discrimination webpage on my website. I'll leave a link below in the description. Now, if your case does settle, you and the company are going to sign a settlement agreement. This is a contract, and it says that the company is paying you a certain amount of money in exchange for you dismissing the lawsuit. 
It will, contain, it will contain confidentiality clauses and a bunch of legal mumbo jumbo that your attorney will explain to you. Next, we have trial preparation. If your case gets within a few months of the trial date, then your attorneys are gonna start working even harder on your case. While not every case goes to trial, every case needs to be prepared for trial. Your lawyers will be organizing documents, preparing transcripts, organizing witnesses, fighting with the other side over what to exclude from trial, meeting with the judge to learn his or her courtroom rules, and a whole lot more. Make sure you return your attorney's phone calls promptly during trial preparation. Your attorney will probably bring you into his or her office to prepare you for your examination at trial. The two of you might even do a mini mock trial so that you get used to the format. Finally, even though everyone has done all the preparation, more often than not, cases settle right before trial. So just because your attorney is preparing like crazy and telling you to keep your calendar open, the case still might settle last minute. Next is trial. This is it, your day in court has arrived. Actually, discrimination trials usually last between one to three weeks, so it's not just a day. The trial first starts with jury selection. Your attorneys get to question the jury pool to find out if anybody has any prejudicial biases. If so, your attorney can remove a certain number of jurors. After jury selection, both sides do opening statements where the attorneys explain what the evidence is going to show. After opening statements, your attorney puts on the plaintiff's case. That's your case. He or she will call you as a witness and you get to take the stand, answer questions, and be cross-examined by the defense lawyer. Generally, this is where you get to tell your story to the people who are deciding your case. Your attorney will also call other witnesses, good and bad, to help you prove your case. When your attorney is finished, the company gets to put on their case. This usually lasts much shorter than your case, and after that, both sides deliver closing arguments, where the attorneys argue the case to the jury. This usually lasts an entire afternoon. Then after the judge gives instructions to the jury and they go, the jury goes and decides your case. Once they come to a decision, everyone comes back to the courtroom and they read the verdict. If you win, it's time to celebrate. If you lose, it's time to cry. Now after the case, sometimes one side or both sides file an appeal. If either side believes that there was a serious error made by the other side or the judge during the trial, they can file an appeal. The appeal extends your case dramatically, usually by a year or so, but it can correct things that were unfair at trial. And that's it. Remember, most cases settle at some point during this long and arduous process. And settlement can happen at any stage of the case, including after an appeal. Once your case is over, it's time to move on with your life. Believe it or not, but a discrimination lawsuit usually has a significant impact on the individual. Usually for the better, but sometimes not. It's important to realize that except in the most extreme cases, your lawsuit is not life or death. Even though lawsuits are stressful and extremely frustrating, if you have a good lawyer and you follow his or her lead, you will probably have a result that you are satisfied with. That's all I have for you today. If you need a lawyer and you're in California, don't be afraid to reach out to my office. If you found this video to be helpful and you're looking for a lawyer, I welcome your phone call. Thank you for watching. Take care.